Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Footprints of the Jesuits, by R.W. Thompson. And yesterday, uh, close to the end of the program, we were talking about these Roman Catholic journalists from around the world who were summoned to the Vatican supposedly to seek advice from the infallible Pope as to how they should treat subjects that pertained to the jurisdiction of the Pope, and particularly about the controversy in Italy where the Italian people rebelled against the temporal power of the Pope and installed their own government, their own constitution. and. It is supposed that one of these Roman Catholic press members suggested, well, maybe we should, uh, you know, acquiesce to this new government in Italy. And, of course, the Pope reacted with outrage and issued a stern rebuke to the press that they were not to have any of their own opinions and that they were simply to go back and use their instruments, their their press, magazines, newspapers, radio, whatever they use, to simply express the opinions of the Pope and not to have any opinions or thought or will of their own expressed in their newspapers. Now, R.W. Thompson, backing up one paragraph from where we ended yesterday, he says, R.W. Thompson says, this was a rebuke indeed. These writers for the press must have been seized with consternation at finding themselves in the presence of such a sovereign, so august and irresponsible. They doubtless supposed that duty to their own consciences and to the public enjoin upon them the obligation to deal fairly and frankly with their patrons by laying before them such opinions as they honestly entertained and such reasons in support of them as really existed in their own minds. These are the legitimate fruits of the liberty of the press, as is shown by the fact that in countries where this liberty is maintained, there's no class of people more independent than public journalists, or whose views on that account are more appreciated and influential. It is not stated that those who assembled in Rome, quote, from all countries, unquote, to seek advice from Pope Leo XIII were of a different class. We are told only that to their inquiries the Pope returned, quote, a severe rebuke, unquote, and commanded them not to, quote, presume to decide in their own right and by their own light, unquote, anything concerning the papacy, but to employ their journals in communicating to their readers the opinions expressed by himself in such manner as not, quote, to seem to have opinions, unquote, of their own. So they, the Pope was, simply put himself in a position to dictate what these Roman Catholic journalists would put in their journals, their newspapers and magazines, on any subject touching the jurisdiction of the papacy, both civil or temporal and spiritual. They're not to think or to have opinions of their own. They're not to express their opinions. They're not even to seem to have an opinion but simply repeat whatever the Pope says, as though it came from the mouth of God Almighty. Now here we are furnished by the present Pope himself a practical example of what papal sovereignty and dominion mean. That is, the preservation to himself of the right of doing and saying whatsoever seems proper in his own eyes and the denial of it to others. You know, that's, that's the, what I, what I refer to as the definition of atheism. Having no respect for the true God. 
but just doing whatever seems right in one's own eyes. That's the definition of atheism, and it fits the papacy. Again, he says, Here we are furnished by the present Pope himself a practical example of what papal sovereignty and dominion mean. That is, the preservation to himself of doing and saying whatsoever seems proper in his own eyes and the denial of it to all others. Does anybody need to be told whether this is tolerance or intolerance? Whether it means intellectual liberty or bondage? A free or a muzzled press? This absolute censorship over the press was intended to be universal, not only because, in his opinion, what he does and says must be so by virtue of the universality of his spiritual power, but because he was addressing public journalists, quote, from all countries, unquote, who were expected to take home with them and obey his pontifical commands. Unquestionably, he intended to avow a general principle, unlike applicable anywhere, uh, excuse me, unquestionably, he intended to avow a general principle, alike applicable everywhere and to all, whether in Europe or America, so that wheresoever a pen of the faithful, that is, a pen of a Roman Catholic journalist, shall be employed in conveying intelligence to the public, quote, bearing on the circumstances, unquote, and condition of the papacy, there is but one possible legitimate use to which it can be applied. That is, to announce what the Pope does as infallibly right and what he says as infallibly true, censuring and condemning all else. He who uses it must not, quote, presume to decide, unquote, anything or any question for himself, or appeal to his own conscience to ascertain its convictions, or, quote, seem to have opinions, unquote, of his own, but must consider himself as surrounded by Egyptian darkness until a, a ray of light shall break upon him from Rome. Until then, he must, be, he must remain deaf to any appeal for information and, quote, like a lamb dumb before his shearer, unquote. This would undoubtedly give to the Pope the liberty for which he is striving, but it would enslave all others brought within the circle of his spiritual jurisdiction. Complete control of the press. It's a matter of Roman Catholic canon law. And this Pope, Pope, Greg, uh, Pope uh, Leo XIII, is simply telling the press, and they are to take it home and believe it and practice it, that they are not to have any opinions regarding matters concerning the jurisdiction of the Pope, but must treat every word that comes out of the Pope's mouth and every word printed by the Pope in his encyclicals and bulls as infallible as having come from the mouth of God Almighty, and they are not to have any opinions about it except to simply print his opinions. <clears throat> now, many people, you know, in my listening audience, are convinced that the press is controlled. But this is not a new phenomenon. We have the case of John Swinton, who lived from 1829 to 1901, he was a Scottish-American journalist, a newspaper publisher, and orator, and he was assembled with other New York press members in a, uh, a, a New York press dinner celebrating the freedom of the press. And John Swinton gave a speech at that dinner, and here is the text of that speech. Quote, There is no such thing in America as an independent press unless it's out in the country towns. You are all slaves. You know it, and I know it. There's not one of you who dares to express an honest opinion. If you expressed it, 
you would know beforehand that it would never appear in print. I am paid $150 for keeping honest opinions out of the paper I'm connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for doing similar things. If I should allow honest opinions to be printed in one issue of my paper, I would be like Othello before 24 hours. My occupation would be gone. The man who would be so foolish as to write honest opinions would be out on the street hunting for another job. The business of a New York journalist is to distort the truth, to lie outright, to pervert, to vilify, and to fawn at the feet of mammon, and to sell his country and his race for his daily bread, or, for what is about the same, his salary. You know this, I know this, and what foolery to be toasting and quote-unquote independent press. We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are jumping jacks. They pull the string and we dance. Our time, our talents, our lives, our possibilities are all the property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. That's a speech given by John Swinton, a, a member of the press. Now, mind you, he made no mention of the papacy and who these rich ruling classes were that determined that no opinion of his or anyone else's would be accepted in the mainstream media. But we have right here in this book by R.W. Thompson proof that the papacy is the one who demands that the press be thoroughly controlled, and few people there be today who will even accept the idea that the pap papacy has so much power as to control our press. It's a matter of Roman Catholic canon law, and any Roman Catholic who holds a place in the press today, uh, no matter what form of press it is, he is under a moral, a spiritual obligation not to express his own opinions, but to report what is put before him. That's what's wrong with the press today. That's why the American people are clueless as to who really governs this country. R.W. Thompson is warning us this is a, an excellent book for understanding what is going on in America and the world today. Now, he continues, he says, that which cannot escape observation in these opinions of the Pope is the extent to which he carries the doctrine of papal infallibility. Okay? This is, remember the first Pope that was declared infallible was in 1870 at the First Vatican Council, Pope Pius IX. He's the one who lost his temporal power in Italy. And his immediate successor was Pope Leo XIII, about whom we are speaking right now. And it was Pope Leo XIII's uh, uh, Pope Leo XIII's stated purpose to restore the temporal power of the Pope everywhere that it had been lost, and to extend it where it was never known before. Pope Leo XIII was Jesuit trained. He was trained to believe that the voice of the Pope was the voice of God Almighty and that there was no jurisdiction in the world that could question his authority. Now he says, That which cannot escape observation in these opinions of the Pope is the extent to which he carries the doctrine of papal infallibility. In common acceptation among the bulk of Christians who accept the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church at Rome, that doctrine is regarded as applying only to matters concerning religious faith and not to matters of fact. These differ from the Jesuits, who insist that it includes both faith and fact, that is, spiritual and temporal. Everything spiritual in its nature and such temporals also as pertain to the spiritual. Pope Leo XIII takes the Jesuit ground for facts which would, excuse me, for facts would be necessarily mingled with faith in the political religious matters submitted to him by the Congress of editors and writers. 
When, therefore, he commands that all he shall do and say concerning the restoration of the temporal power and the interests of the papacy shall be accepted as infallibly right and true, not to be called in question by any, he conclusively shows the effect of his early Jesuit education and training. So what we're to get from all this is that papal infallibility and the, and the restrictions on the press and speech that this pope is, is imposing as a matter of spiritual dogma in the Roman Catholic Church is the idea of the Jesuits. And it says, and since he expects all Roman Catholics to accept this doctrine as a necessary part of the faith, it is specially important for the people of the United States to understand the extent to which he expects it to be carried wheresoever his spiritual authority shall reach. We are plainly and expressly told that it includes political religious questions. And this is affirmed by him in the incident related by his biographer. The Jesuits themselves could say no more, and are careful not to say less, in their definition of papal infallibility, for fear that some inquisitive minds might discover loopholes in the doctrine through which individual opinions might escape, and thus give approval to liberty of thought, of speech, and of the press, and to the forms of popular government which they underlie. The Pope does not intend to be misunderstood and therefore takes pains not to leave at the not to leave the least doubt with regard to his opinion upon the great question of the right of a people to establish and maintain a government separated and independent from the Roman Catholic Church, as was done by the people of the United States when they formed their government, founded upon their own will. He well knows that all governments of this character have been the result and are the fruits of the Protestant Reformation. And therefore, when he found it necessary for him to address a letter to the Archbishop of Cologne touching affairs in Germany, he denounced them as socialistic, or in other words, as threatening to the peace and happiness of society. Remember, Germany was the was ground zero for the Protestant Reformation. Okay? And he describes this as socialistic and damaging to the peace and happiness of society. This is a condemnation of the Protestant Reformation. Remember the Pope limits sometimes his language to just governments that are contrary to the divine will of the Pope, constitutional and republican forms of government. But what he's really condemning is the Protestant Reformation. And, of course, that's right up the Jesuit alley, too. You can tell by the language of this Pope, Pope Leo XIII, that he's been thoroughly trained by the Jesuits, who were created for one purpose and one purpose only, was to destroy Protestantism from off the face of the earth. He says that he may not be misapprehended with regard to the character and forms of government he intended to condemn uh, as of this character. He assigned, quote, the 16th century, unquote, as the period when the seeds out of which they grew were sown, well knowing, as all intelligent people do, that the right of the people to govern themselves by laws reflective of their will then began to take root. The 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, specifically 1517, October 31st, the Protestant Reformation. That, that's what he's condemning here. All these ills that the Pope is suffering, his temporal power being rejected all over the Roman Catholic countries in Europe, is a direct result of the Protestant Reformation. Praise God, right? The only problem is they didn't just remove themselves from out from underneath the temporal boot of the Pope. They should have removed themselves from his spiritual jurisdiction too. He says that period is especially odious to the Pope on account of the results foreshadowed by it, and because he sees in it the germs of those measures of public policy which have acquired such growth and strength as to undermine the Pope's temporal power. 
without which the world seems to him to be ever uh, to be given over to the dominion of evil. Do you realize this is where the mortal wound of the beast was inflicted, the Protestant Reformation? It appeared to be a mortal wound by simply removing the temporal power of the Pope from their countries and establishing their own government. You see, the Pope says that only he has, possesses the Holy Spirit, that only he has the ability to read and interpret Scripture and to teach the world. He does not believe that Jesus accomplished anything on the cross or that the Holy Spirit was imparted to the people long before the Pope was ever the diabolical institution in the world that it is today. See, he does not understand that the people were given the Holy Spirit. Those washed in the blood of Jesus Christ were endued with the spirit of holiness and the ability to read and understand and teach the Scriptures. And therefore, they understood the Word of God and the law of God, and having now a holy conscience within them, were capable of governing themselves according to God's holy law and not to the Pope's. This is the definition of Antichrist. The papacy is playing out its role, its prophetic and biblical and historical role, as the counterfeit Christ on the earth. Counterfeit Christ simply means Antichrist. Now, the Pope's throwing a hissy fit because people no longer regard the Pope as a just king. And to maintain rights and freedoms, and to express their own will in their own nations, they've overthrown the temporal power of the Pope and installed their own governments. The Pope says this is heresy. The papacy has always believed that only he, only he the papacy, has the right to rule and the right to govern. King of kings and lord of lords the spiritual priest of the Roman Catholic Church, and the temporal king of the world. He says that period is especially odious to him, the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, especially odious to the Pope on account of the results foreshadowed by it, and because he sees in it the germs of those measures of public policy which have acquired such growth and strength as to undermine the Pope's temporal power, without which the world seems to him to have, give, have been to be given over to the dominion of evil, the dominion of Satan. You've overthrown the, to the Pope's temporal power. Now the world is going to collapse. How contrary that is to the teaching of Holy Scripture. We've come to the end of the, half, the first half. We'll return after the messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. One hundred days, one hundred subscribers at seven dollars will bring FirstAmendmentRadio.com to the minimum level necessary to sustain it through 2015. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. Seven dollars a month. Really, you can afford that for our Protestant First Amendment rights and the gospel of the kingdom message. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Go to support. Support.firstamendmentradio.com I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Have you seen the Left Behind movies? Have you read the Left Behind fictional book series? Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce, in the minds of all, this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. Because they see the world stage shaping to fulfill what they have been led to believe 
is sound biblical interpretation, a left behind rapture scenario, this false view of prophecy is reinforced in the mind, not only of its adherents, but also includes those who have been merely exposed to the specific media. Is it possible that false prophecy can be fulfilled? The rapture theories have always been in dispute. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib disputes have risen up in exclusively evangelical circles of recent history, so that when true believers don't suddenly disappear, this element will easily go by the wayside when all see a new Jewish temple begin to be built. Will this be part of the great delusion that will come upon the whole earth? It seems that this great prophetic delusion has already overcome practically the entire American evangelical and Christian world. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. To learn more, visit CrossTheBorder.org. That's C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org. Record budget deficits, bankruptcies galore, and the U.S. dollar is at an all-time low. With today's gloomy economic outlook, safe investments are often hard to find. For over a decade, Melody Cedarstrom at Discount Gold and Silver Trading Company has been helping people secure their future by investing in the precious metals. Melody has the honesty, integrity, and experience that is often lacking in the precious metals business. Let her put it to work for you. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update. We'll continue where we left off. He says the period we're speaking of, the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, is especially odious to Pope Leo XIII on account of the results foreshadowed by it and because he sees in it the germs of those measures of public policy which have acquired such growth and strength as to undermine the Pope's temporal power without which the world seems to him to be given over to the dominion of evil. Papacy regards the Protestant Reformation as evil overtaking the world. The return to true biblical Christianity is regarded by the Pope as to be a return to the dominion of evil. And people continuously argue with me about who the Antichrist is. It says, intending, therefore, to show what is manifestly a fixed purpose in his mind, 
what he regards as the source of the ills which threaten to, over, to overwhelm modern society with ruin, he availed himself of the occasion of his Episcopal letter to the Archbishop of Cologne to say, quote, Hence, an impious thing never dreamed of even by the old pagans. States were formed without any regard to God or to the order by him established. It was given as a dictate of truth that public authority derives from God neither its origin nor its majesty, nor its power to command, all that coming, on the contrary, from the multitude, and that the people deemed themselves free of all divine sanctions, consented only to be ruled by such laws as they chose to enact, unquote. In other words, it's, it's, it's an overthrow of the rightful throne of God, the papacy, that the people suddenly think themselves worthy to govern themselves when God instituted the papacy to govern the people. You see, the papacy regards self-government as rebellion against the divine right jurisdiction of the Pope, both spiritually and temporally. And it says, and following these opinions to their logical consequences, he pictures the condition into which society has been thrown by such institutions as the people have created for themselves by separating church and state. As in the United States, he thus draws the sad and deplorable picture, quote, by spreading such doctrines far and wide, such an unbridled licentiousness of thought and action was begotten everywhere, that it is no wonder if men of the lower classes, disgusted with their poverty-stricken homes and their dismal workshops, are filled with an inordinate desire to rush upon the homes and the fortunes of the wealthy. No wonder is it that tranquility has vanished from all public and private life, and that the human race seems hurried onward toward ruin, unquote. He says, now that lawlessness prevails, the poor are going to pilfer off the riches of the r ruling classes. Never mind that history records that these rich landed uh, wealthy of this period, this pre-Protestant Reformation period, were those who had stolen the land from the people and given it to the church. The Protestant Reformation brought the land back into the control of the people, and it put the people in control of their governments, and it left the Pope without power or wealth. You see, when it really comes down to it, that's what the Pope most heartily laments, is the loss of his wealth. Because his wealth is his power. It is by his wealth that he can command armies around the world. His wealth and his temporal power is the sword of the Roman Catholic Church that never never shrinks from shed, shedding the blood of God's holy people. He laments the loss of his temporal power and of his riches and blames the people for taking command of their own lives. The papacy would have us all to be irresponsible and simply governed and dictated to by the papacy and the kings of the earth. He says, in contemplating the picture of modern prosperity and progress, that which is to be found mainly, if not only, where monarchs have been dispensed with or their hands tied by constitutional checks and guards, he imagines nothing discernible about Quote, uh, he, he imagines nothing discernible but unbridled licentiousness of thought and action. Nothing but desolation, decay, ruin, and death. In this way, he accounts for his anxiety to regain the temporal power which the Italian people took away from Pope Pius IX, so that by obtaining perfect liberty for himself as both a spiritual and a temporal monarch, in other words, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he may disperse his ecclesiastical forces. I will add the words, his shadow government throughout the world, and so reform it as to get rid entirely of this impious thing 
called popular government and teach the people that by assuming to make their own laws, they have reached the borders of a gulf from which the papal arm alone can rescue them. The world needs to be rescued from its error by the Pope. The whole world needs to be rescued from this rebellion, from this impious thing called the Protestant Reformation. And that is the goal of the papacy, to govern the world without opposition. That's the new world order. R.W. R. Thompson asks, are these utterances of Pope Leo XIII to be accepted as infallibly true? as he required those to be which he made to the public journalists who went all the way to Rome to ask his advice? In both cases, the questions involved are political-religious, and as he commanded the, la the latter to have no opinions of their own, nor seem to have any, even Jesuit ingenuity and sophistry can discover no distinction between them. In the one case, as in the other, his meaning is clear and unmistakable, that these matters are all within the spiritual jurisdiction of the Pope, and that whatsoever he has said or may hereafter say concerning them must be accepted as expressing the will of God. This conclusion cannot be escaped, nor does he intend that it shall be. For instead of leaving his, mean, his meaning to be discovered by reading between the lines, it is plain, palpable, and distinct. His eloquent biographer does not mistake him. When the same questions were discussed by him in an encyclical, and the same arguments substantially repeated, this eminent divine rapturously affirms that his utterances, quote, were like the second promulgation of the law on which rest the foundations of the moral world. That's a quote. He says that the Pope's utterances, quote, were like the second promulgation of the law on which the foundations of the moral world, uh, which rest the foundations of the moral world. In other words, they're equivalent to the law of Moses. The Pope's utterances are equivalent to the law of Moses. It thus appears plainly and palpably that the modern nations are confronted by the fact that the Pope has denounced the making of laws by the people, that is, self-government, as an impious thing, which inevitably leads to, quote, unbridled licentiousness of thought and action, unquote, and is hurrying the human race, quote, onward to its ruin, unquote, and that with his own sanction and pontifical approval, the faithful are instructed to liken his commands upon this and other kindred subjects to the promulgation of the law to Moses in the Mount. What more important and interesting question could be submitted to the modern progressive nations, and especially to the United States, than this? It is an arraignment of the chief fundamental principle of our civil institutions a proposition to remove the cornerstone upon which our national edifice is resting. Our fathers separated church and state deliberately and wisely, and more than a century of experience has assured us a degree of prosperity unsurpassed anywhere in the world. Yet the Pope, considering this the triumph of evil, of the state over the church, and of Belial over Christ, invites us to come within the circle of his jurisdiction, his spiritual jurisdiction, so that every law of the people conflicting with Roman Catholic canon law shall be blotted from our statute books and our limbs bound with the chains forged in papal workshops. If he could achieve this result, he would still admit our right to manage such of our, of our affairs as did not conflict with the interest and in the policy of the church over which he presides, but such as did, he would assert the spiritual and divine power to regulate himself. He would be content that we should carry on our industrial pursuits, sow, our har sow and harvest our grain, build our houses and barns, construct our roads, and pursue our ordinary occupations in peace. But he would add tithes to our taxes, deny the right of civil marriage, 
put a stop to the erection of Protestant churches, plant his pontifical foot upon every form of dissenting worship, and demand in the name of religion that he should be recognized as both a spiritual and temporal monarch over every foot of soil set apart for the use of the Roman church and over every devotee of that church insofar as its interests and necessities should require. And to make it sure that all these things should come last, should become lasting and perpetual, he would close all of our schoolhouses and turn all of our teachers adrift so that the minds of the pupils should be molded by Jesuit influence as his own was in order that the blessed period of the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, should be revived and all memory of the Protestant Reformation be blotted out forever. You see the New World Order taking shape right before your very eyes? It's a return to the Dark Ages. There's nothing going to be new at all about the New World Order. We can know everything that needs to be known about this so-called New New World Order simply by studying the Dark Ages and the unquestioning authority that the papacy exerted over all mankind. And don't forget the blood that was shed, the incalculable blood that was shed by this unbridled monstrosity called the papacy which the Bible calls the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who deceives the whole world. The Pope's biographer, in order to show his readiness for the, for the part he has to play in this revolution in our affairs, takes occasion to disavow and repudiate in explicit terms the doctrine of the natural equality of mankind as set forth in our Declaration of Independence seeming to suppose that when the proper time shall arrive, some modern pope may be found who will declare that immortal, that in, that immortal instrument null and void, as Pope Innocent III did the Magna Carta of England. R. W. Thompson's predicting the overthrow of our Constitution by the Pope, and he's absolutely correct. As irreligious as R. W. Thompson may or may not have been in his life, I regard him as a prophet, not in the biblical sense, but at least he has, he knows enough about history to see the fulfillment of the new world order in our day, hundreds of years before it happened. <clears throat> he says that the Constitution is going to be overthrown in this country. Some modern pope is going to overthrow the Constitution of the United States just as did Pope Innocent III overthrow the Magna Carta of England. History is going to repeat itself. He says he makes this disavowal in these words, quote, The inequality which exists among men living in society arises from nature and its author, capital A, just as from him, capital H, comes in the magistrate the right to rule, and in the subject the duty to obey, unquote. That's pretty de- definitive, isn't it? Men are going to be made equal by the Pope. And what did we see when we read the, the uh, encyclical Caritas and Veritate? That the goods of the world are meant to be used equally by all. And that the rich nations of the world, the affluent nations of the world, the wealthy nations of the world are going to have to redistribute their wealth. What does that do to the Constitution? If we allow the Pope to assert his spiritual and temporal authority and to redistribute the wealth of this country into all the third world countries, what does that do to our Constitution? What does that do to our national sovereignty? They're both gone, aren't they? Some modern Pope has indeed overthrown our Constitution. He says it is not to be supposed that this sounds well in any American ears The author takes advantage of the general sentiment that all things have their source in God as their author and assumes from this that because men are differently differently endowed by nature, intellectually and physically, they are therefore, by the laws of nature, potentially divided into a superior and inferior class. That's right, two classes, just like during the Dark Ages, the rich ruling elite and the serfs, Those who govern and those who are governed, okay, 
Never mind the Holy Spirit. Never mind the Bible. God has raised a, gen, a, 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 a segment of the world that are to govern the rest of the world. Two classes. He says the former to rule and the latter to obey. This is the papal theory of society and government. But from the standpoint of modern advancement, it will readily be seen <clears throat> that it contains two capital errors. It mistakes social for political inequality and perpetuates the power to rule in one class and the obligation to obey in the other, leaving the latter no chance of changing its condition of inferiority and submissiveness. In other words, if you were born into the into the uh, lower class, you just as well get happy with your state of affairs because by divine authority, you've been given the lower class and you can't fairly advance yourself without violating God's ordinance. And likewise, those who he has created in this world to be the governors shall remain the governors and shall not have to question, not sub, subject themselves to the question of the lower class. You see how the Jesuits twist and pervert the papacy? Two classes. A return to the dark days. No middle class, just the rich ruling elite. The nameless, faceless, rich ruling elite, like Alex Jones talks about all the time. Who we're told by R. W. Thompson is the ecclesiastics. The priestly class. Those in who are whose charge is the Pope, that's who the rich ruling elite are. They they are born into the ruling class. We're born into the ruled class, and what and we are not to question the rulers, but to simply acquiesce as a matter of religious faith. To do otherwise is to be condemned by the papacy, God on earth. It fails to observe that what men do in social intercourse is one thing and concerns themselves in immediate associates only, whereas what they shall do in civil and political intercourse is another thing and concerns the community of which they are members. It does not follow because they do not in their inter intercourse with each other enjoy social equality, that they should not share alike in political equality in order thereby <clears throat> to promote the welfare of all. The contrary is far more reasonable and just, that civil and political equality shall prevail, in order that the whole of society may be brought as nearly as possible to the common ground of social equality, that is, that the opportunities for equality should be open to all. This is the progressive theory of government. But the papal and the retrogressive theory, as set forth by Pope Leo XIII and his biographer, is opposed to this for the reason all, uh, for the reason alleged by the letter, excuse me, for the reason alleged by the latter that God and nature established inequality in order that the right of the superior class to govern and the obligation of the inferior class to obey shall remain perpetual. This fallacy was successfully maintained during the Middle Ages, and so long as church and state remained united, because monarchism possessed sufficient power to enable the ruling class to hold the multitude in inferiority. But as the example of Christ during his humanity demonstrated that men could lead pious and Christian lives without regard to the character of the governments which ruled over them, that, in fact, civil governments can have no rightful authority over internal religious convictions, the influence of that example opened through the Protestant Reformation the way to such enlightenment as points out, as pointed out the necessity for return to primitive Christianity in order to fit communities organized as states for equality of rights under governments of their own insofar as all things pertaining to their general welfare were concerned. This equality is not confined to aggregated communities alone 
but extends to the individuals composing them in all matters not relating to the good of the whole. Among these, made prominently conspicuous under the civil institutions of the United States, is the natural right of each individual to worship God as his own conscience shall dictate, without interference from any quarter, so that by enlightenment he may realize the full sense of his own personality and thereby increase his ability to add to the common stock of prosperity. Experience has shown that this could be accomplished in no other way than by disuniting church and state, and therefore we in this country are well assured that the framers of our government acted wisely in doing this, by assigning to the former the spiritual and to the latter the temporal sphere as was the case during the lives of Christ and the Apostles. In furtherance of this end, it became necessary that our Declaration of Independence should establish the proposition as a fundamental principle that all men are entitled by the law of nature to perfect equal equality, excuse me, to perfect equality of rights. And while our sense of security may lead us to bear with some degree of patience and papal censure of this principle, they are mistaken, they are mistaken who argue therefrom that we can be persuaded upon any conditions to exchange that principle for one involving civil and political inequality which the papacy recommends to us as alone in conformity to the divine law as the Pope interprets it. You beginning to figure out why the framers of our Constitution separated church and state, to give us the right to question this man in Rome who calls himself the replacement of the Son of God on earth, that demands both a spiritual and a temporal scepter when he deserves neither. Separation of church and state. If you ever see church and state being reunited in this country like it is today, you better know the tyrant from the Tiber is about to roar like a lion. And the current one is a Jesuit priest. That's all the time we have for today on Inquisition Update. We'll continue with R.W. Thompson's The Footprints of the Jesuits on the program tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordered.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book the rapture will be canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.